Good morning. It's certainly good to be here this morning. And with all the wonderful bright sunshine that we have, and yes, the sun is shining. It may be above the clouds, but the sun is still shining. <clears throat> Glad to see each of you out this morning. I know some of you are... Uh, Becky is you know, shaking hands over here. She says, don't touch. But we appreciate the presence of each and every one of you. You know, when you start to build something... Uh, do you uh, pick up a hammer and some boards and nails and just start nailing things together or do you have a plan when you start to build? Do you put something together without thinking about it first? Do you uh, take a trip and not have any idea which direction you're going? You know, back... Um, when I was in scouting many, many years ago, we did a flip, flip a coin hike. Every intersection we came to, we flipped a coin to see whether we go left or right or go straight. We walked around the same block four times. And we decided after that, that fourth time around the block that we were going to not go that same direction again. Because we were just going by chance. How are, how are we going to get there? And we did have a destination. We needed to be at the campsite by 5 o'clock that night. And we started out about 7 o'clock that morning. It was only 7 miles. But we ended up walking about 12 because we didn't go a direct route. We didn't have a plan. But when we talk about religion, when we talk about what God wants, God has a plan. And do you realize, do you understand that that plan is from the beginning? Let's go back to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, beginning in verse 15. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest eat, freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thou there excuse me, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. God had given man the plan. And this was his plan for this point in time. As we go on down through here and read in verse 18, it says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make for him and help meet for him or acceptable for him. In verse 19, And out of the ground of the Lord God formed every beast of the field and, out of, and every fowl of the air and brought them into Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a help meet for him. There wasn't somebody that was acceptable that was um, a meet for him to help him. In verse 21, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of, the, of his ribs and flesh closed up thereof and closed up the flesh there instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. We see here that God had put a plan into action. He had laid it out. He knew what was going on. He knew the direction that everything was to go. And he implemented it. As we go on through the Old Testament, we go over to Genesis chapter 17.
in Genesis chapter 17, beginning in verse 1. And when Adam was ninety years old and nine, the Lord appeared unto Abraham, or Abram, excuse me. And when Abram was ninety and nine years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect, and I will make my covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. So we see here that that God had made him a promise that he would be a father of many nations. In verse 5, it says, Neither shall thy, shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee, and I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant. Here again, God is talking to him. He says, My covenant between me and thee, and thy seed, and thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. Here God is, has told Abraham that he's going to make a, a covenant with him, that he's going to be the father of many nations, and that that covenant is going to remain with him and his seed forever, an everlasting covenant. Uh, we go on down to uh, verse 9. It says, And God said unto Abram, Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. This is my covenant, which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after, after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised, and ye shall be circumcised, and ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised every among you, every man child in your generations. He that is born in thine house, or bought with money, or any stranger which is not of thy seed. He that is born in thy house, and he that is bought with money, must needs be circumcised, and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. So we see that there's things that were done, there's things that were required, there were actions that had to be taken in this covenant. As we go on down to verse 23 of Genesis chapter 17, And Abraham took Ishmael his son, and all that were born in his house, and all that were brought, bought with money, every male among the men, of Abraham's house and circumcised the flesh of their foreskins in the selfsame day as God had said unto him. And Abraham was ninety years old and nine when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And Ishmael his son was thirteen years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. In the selfsame day was Abraham circumcised and Ishmael his son and all the men of his house born in the house and bought with money of the stranger were circumcised with him. We see here that Abraham was obedient to God's command. He did what God asked. He was working or obeying the covenant that was made between him and God. As we move on forward in time, we come to the Mosaical Law. In Exodus chapter 39, Turn over to Exodus 39. Beginning in verse in verse 30. And they made the plate of the holy crown of pure gold and wrote upon it a writing like to the engravings of a signet, holiness to the Lord. And they tied it into a lace of blue to fasten it on the high, to fasten it on high upon the mitre as the Lord commanded Moses. 
Thus was all the work of the tabernacle of the tent of the congregation finished, and the children of Israel did according to all that Moses, all the, that the Lord commanded Moses. So they did. And Don brought up in his lesson that when the when Moses established the tabernacle, put it together, it's recorded in Hebrews that he did everything according to what God had commanded on the mount. As we go on down to verse 42. According to all that the Lord commanded Moses, so the children of Israel made all the, all the work. And Moses did look upon all the work, and behold, they had done it as the Lord had commanded. Even so had they done it, and Moses blessed them. So here again, there was commandments made. There, were, there was a plan. It was put together. It was given to mankind. Mankind, in this case Moses, had to implement it had to put it to work, had to teach it to others. When Moses came down off the mountain, do you think everybody in the, the congregation knew what was going on? No, actually they were, um, they were in the midst of sin. But they, they fixed what they were doing. They corrected wh where they were at. And they came back and did as God had commanded so we see that that plan is continuing. As we go on into the New Testament, God still has a plan. And this is, as we go through the, all of these different plans, it's, it's really, it's one plan. We'll see that here momentarily. But let's first go to Galatians chapter 1. In Galatians chapter 1, uh, we're going to start in verse 1. We're going to read down through verse 12. Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia. Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to remember this section here. And from our Lord Jesus Christ, in verse 4, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. I want you to keep that in mind as we go through this next section of reading here. As we go into verse 5, it says, To whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which what we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. In verse 9, as we said before, so say I now again, if any man, and the word man there, if you notice that that word is italicized in the King James Version, it's italicized, it's not in the original text. So let's go back and look at this. If any preach any other gospel unto you than ye have received, let him be accursed. He said that same statement twice. Why? To emphasize it, because it's important. There's not another gospel. There's only one gospel. He goes on to say in verse 10, it says, For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after men, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now what is this gospel? Gospel simply means good news. Let's go back to verse 4. The end of verse 3 and then into verse 4 says, From our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. That 
is the gospel. That is the good news. We have salvation available to us if we are willing to obey the will of the Father. If we are willing to obey, if we're willing to commit, if we are willing to do the work that's set before us. Everywhere we've looked, all the way up from the beginning of time to this point in time, it's not just, oh, well, yeah, I've got a free ride to heaven. There's been a task that has to be done. There's work involved. You know, when we look at this, let's look at a couple other things. If we look at, at where this puts people who teach salvation by faith only, let's, let's go back to James chapter 2. Now, we've probably all heard that you can be saved just by believing in, in Jesus. You just have to believe on Jesus. Let's see what God's word has to say. James chapter 2, beginning in verse 17. Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works. I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God. Thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Now what does that tell us about faith? Faith, can faith save us by itself? Well, let's go on and read a little bit more. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac, his son, upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Ye see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. A man is not justified by faith only. Now, I've got a question for you. How many times does God have to say something for it to be true? For it to be required? For it to be something that we must do to, to do the will of the Father? When God said we need to do something, then we need to do it. Whether it's one time or whether it's 30 times. We cannot be saved by faith only. So what do we need to do to be saved? Well, we can go back to the Word of God and find out. In Romans chapter 10. And Don read these verses this morning. I'm going to go through them again. Romans chapter 10. Um, we're going to, well, we're actually we're going to start in verse 17, and then we'll go back to verses 9 and 10. Romans 10, 17, so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So we see, how do we get faith? We get it by hearing the word of God. Okay, so if we have, can we have faith in God if we've never heard about God? Can you have faith in something that you don't know anything about? You can't. Because you don't know anything about it. So then we have to hear the word of God in order to, to, to have that faith, in order to believe. So let's go back to verses 9 and 10. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the, man, with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Now the words unto here are the... the the word ice, I-C-E. These words are always looking forward to something in the future. So what do we have? We have in this, um, 
For with the, the heart man believeth unto righteousness, or going toward righteousness in the future, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Confession is made unto salvation. But they're not there yet. Going in the right direction. But they're not there yet. If we go on and look at um, in Jan- or, excuse me, John chapter 8 and verse 24... Jesus speaking here, says, I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins, for if ye believe not that I am, and notice here again, the word he is italicized, if you believe not that I am, ye shall die in your sins. Jesus at this point in time made a claim to be eternal, to be God, to be deity. If we turn over to um, verse 58, the same chapter. John chapter 8, verse 58. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. You'll notice back here in verse uh, 24, or verse 25, Then said they unto him, Who art thou? And Jesus said unto them, Even the same that I said unto you from the beginning. When Jesus made this statement again in verse 58, in verse 59, Then took they up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. They knew, they realized what he had just said. He said, I am God. Before Abraham was, I am. I exist eternally. Jesus speaking here, and I I don't recall, I think it's, five or six times here in John chapter 8, that he makes the claim that he is deity. And they don't really pick up on it until the end of the chapter here. So we have to believe. What do we have to believe? We have to believe that Jesus is eternal. Jesus is the Son of God. How do we know that? Because we have to hear the word. We have to hear the word in order to believe. Let's go on into uh, Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13, beginning in, in verse 1. Therefore, or there were present at that season some that, that told him of the Galatians whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answering said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans, because they suffered such things? I tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. In verse 4, Or those eighteen upon whom the tower of Siloam fell and slew them, think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you nay, But except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. We need to repent of our sins. Repentance is that of turning from, ceasing to do. No longer doing what we've been doing in the past that's wrong in the sight of God, but rather doing those things that are right in the sight of God. If we go on to uh, confess, which is Romans 10, Ten, we've just we're just there. Go back over there momentarily. Confession is made unto salvation. The end of verse ten. We have to confess Christ. We have to, to and uh, I think Bruce has brought it up multiple times. Others have brought it up as well. Confession is not something we do one time. Confession is the way that we live our life. Do we confess Christ to those that we're around, to those that we hang with, to our our friends, our neighbors, our family, in our daily life? Or do they see just another person out here in the world? 
We have to confess Christ. And we need to be baptized in 1 Peter chapter 3. First Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 20, which sometimes were disobedient when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. Wait a minute. It says eight souls were saved by water. I thought the water destroyed the hundreds of thousands of people that were on the earth at the time. Yes, it did. But because... Those eight souls were in the ark. The ark lifted them above the destruction of the water. The water lifted the ark. But they had to be in the ark in order to have salvation. They had to be in the ark. In verse 21, he says, The like figure wherein even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Verse 22. Who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God. Angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. Jesus is no longer on this earth. He is reigning with his father in heaven. But he will return to this earth someday. We need to be prepared for that day. You know in Mark chapter 16. 15 and 16. I think Don read that this morning as well. I don't remember if he read it or if I was reading it. But Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. He that believeth and is baptized you know, the word and is a conjunction. Both have to be there in order for the, for the statement to be true. You have to believe and you have to be baptized. Is that all that's required? We've already gone through and looked at repentance and confession, so there's other things involved. Hearing the word. Believe and repent and confess and being baptized. But here Jesus says you have to be baptized in order to be saved. And he says, he that believeth not shall be damned. And I've heard the argument, people say, well, he didn't say he that believeth not and is not baptized. That's, that argument doesn't hold because you take either one of them out of the picture and the first statement is not true. It's a, it's a logic statement. Both have to be there. Let's look at um, Acts chapter 8. In Acts chapter 8, in verse 35, Philip and the eunuch. So then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Let's just stop there for a minute. The eunuch was, was in the chariot and Philip came up with him and said, Do you understand what you're reading? He says, How can I except some man would, would teach me? So here, Philip opened his mouth and began the same scripture, took the eunuch from where he was at and taught him Jesus. Now let's go on and read from here in verse 36. And as they went on their way, they came upon a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Now, I ask you a question. How did the eunuch know he had to be baptized? If all that... that er, if all that Philip taught him was Jesus. He had to teach baptism. There's no other way about it. He had to teach baptism. I have heard people say, well, you just need to teach Jesus and the rest of it will take care of itself. You cannot teach Jesus without teaching baptism. It cannot be done. Let's go on and read here a little bit more. And Philip answers him in verse 37 and said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. 
And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Here we see that good confession made by the eunuch. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. But you see what he had to do? He had to believe with all of his heart. He had to be fully committed in order to be a candidate for baptism. So let me ask you this question. Where does that put infant baptism? Can an infant be baptized? Can an infant believe with all of his heart? No, he can't. So where does that put it? If, well, if we go back to Galatians, if any, if any man teach any other gospel than what you've been taught, let him be accursed. Those that teach infant baptism are lost. They are accursed. Why? Because they're teaching a gospel that is not another gospel, but it's perverted. It's a perversion of the gospel of Christ. There is no good news in teaching something that's wrong. Pretty simple, isn't it? When you get in and look at it, it's really pretty simple. Let's go on and read uh, in John chapter 1. In John chapter 1, beginning in verse 12, it says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Now let me ask you this. What does it mean, the power to become? Does that mean you're already there? Those that believe on his name? No, he says the power to become sons of God. Belief doesn't put you in a saved state. It's required. It's part of it. But it doesn't put you there. But it gives you the power or the right to become a son of God. But it doesn't put you there. Let's look at Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16 and verse 25. It says, now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret since the world began. The gospel was kept secret since the world began. This mystery, but now it's been revealed. In verse 26, but now is made manifest and by scripture of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. Are we obedient of the faith? That faith, that, that gospel that's been given to us? Have we put on Christ in baptism? If we turn over to 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1. Beginning in verse 19. But with the precious blood of Christ, as, a, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained from the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. It's foreordained from the foundation of the world that the blood of Christ, as a, as a lamb, as a pure lamb without spot, without blemish, This plan was put in place before the world began. In verse 21, Who by him do believe in God who raised him up from the dead and gave him glory 
that your faith and hope might be in God. Where is your hope today? Where is your faith today? In verse 22, seeing that ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto, the, un, unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. Loving one another. Do we truly love our brethren? That's a question we need to ask ourselves. In verse 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed, by the word of God, who liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of, of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. The gospel is preached unto you. The good news is preached unto you. You have the good news to you today. That Christ died for you. Christ died for your sins. Once we put on Christ in baptism, we need to live faithfully. Revelation chapter 2 verse 10. I'm going to use Don's verse again here. Don preached about half my lesson this morning, but that's just the way it goes. Repetition is a good thing. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, that ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Tribulation for ten days. Ten days being a a complete or a limited amount of time, a short amount of time. It's limited, the tribulation that we have. Eternity is not limited. Eternity is a very, very, very long time. And each of us here in this auditorium today, and anybody that may be listening on the internet, each of us, We'll spend eternity somewhere. Will it be heaven or will it be hell? Will you be obedient to the plan that has been laid out from the foundation of the world? Or will you let it slip through your fingers? We have no guarantees for tomorrow. We have no insurance that we'll have that we'll see tomorrow. We need to make changes in our life today. If you've never put on Christ in baptism, that invitation is open today to be obedient to that plan, to that gospel that Christ died for, shed his blood for you and I. If you've done this in times past and you have sin in your life, then that sin must be repented of. That invitation is open. If it's public, it must be repented of publicly. If you simply need the prayers of the church because of difficult times in your life, we invite you to come as we stand and sing the song that's been selected.